Well, thank you for that warm introduction. It's always fun to watch some of those college pictures and college years. Wow, what an honor and an experience to be up here in front of my peers and talking about something that I'm truly passionate about and something that really connects us in the room. And I was talking to President Latendre in the green room a little bit earlier, and I was like, what am I doing here? Look at the lineup of the speakers. Like, I don't, I don't belong, I don't fit in. We've got Como and Faxon and Couples and Duffy and Gregory. Like, this lineup just blows me away. And the past couple of years, this teaching and coaching summit has just been really jam-packed with some amazing speakers. And he's like, well, you don't. You're just the warm-up act. So as you jokingly said that, I thought to myself, how do I fit in? And what I talk about, nobody else in the world talks about it through this lens of golf performance. And how I've bridged my worlds of golf and psychology, there's no one else on the planet who is able to take what I do and translate it to the golf world. And so I think that's what's special as the mission of this teaching and coaching summit is to make you all better. The information that you're gonna learn today I think is really gonna help you understand your students on a much deeper level, but ultimately help you understand yourself on a deeper level. Because we're all connected in our room through our athletic traumas and our personal traumas. And so I'm really honored to share some interesting insight with you about golf psychology. And hopefully you'll take this back to your lesson tee and you'll be able to impart some change with players from the inside out rather from the outside in. So the outline that I plan in my speaking time today is to give you a little bit of background of who I am and what I do. More from the inside out rather than what you see from the outside in. And then we're going to talk about what is athletic trauma? What is golf trauma? And I'm going to share with you some cutting edge research that I recently published that applies some psychological tools that I use in my practice to help golfers be the best version of themselves and to help people be the best version of themselves. And if you decide that you're not going to become a psychologist or a psychotherapist, what can you do with this information to actually make your students better or to make yourself better as a competitor, as a person? We'll talk a little bit about what are some take-homes that you can use through coaching trauma and also through tapping to help move through some different trauma experiences, decrease anxiety, but also set some templates for a positive performance moving forward. Several years ago, I decided to reinvent my teaching philosophy. And I really found myself stuck, as Jamie mentioned in his presentation, in this micro point of view rather than a macro point of view. And I was coaching players from the outside in. I was caught up in swing mechanics and over-the-top swings and weak grips and how to make the ball flight better. And then through my interactions with students, I was realizing there's more than just this golf swing that I can observe from the outside. Oftentimes, lessons might start with a student kind of what I call verbal diarrhea, what has happened in their day before we even get to hitting a golf ball, telling me about what trials and tribulations they might have gone through. Sort of like when you go and get a haircut and you sit down and you tell your barber or your stylist everything that's going on in your world, kind of this unleashing of what's happening in their inner experience. And I thought to myself, then there's more than just coaching swings, we're coaching people, we're coaching humans, and what can I do on a deeper level to understand that inside experience? And can I help them improve their performance by knowing more about what's going on in their personal world and their personal experience competing than just what's on my flight scope, or just what's on body track, or just how the face is connecting with the ball. And so I decided to take some night classes in clinical psychology and earn my master's in psychology and then continue on in my doctorate. So I would teach during the day and I would go to school at night and write papers, any waking moment that I had. And then I decided, well, if I'm doing this much work, I might as well have a license to practice. And so I became a licensed therapist in the state of California and earned two licenses in marriage and family therapy and professional clinical counseling. And this allowed me the privilege to be able to help players through a clinical lens and combine that with my mechanical skill of being able to help improve those mechanics 
So now I had the ability and the privilege to help golfers from the outside in and the inside out. And in psychology, therapists sort of joke, why do we become therapists? And a lot of times it's to help ourselves. And I think through my stories today, my work through psychology has certainly helped me become a better person and it certainly helped me become a better performer. And I've been so blessed to be recognized on different levels and to be able to be a national speaker and to share my experiences with my friends and colleagues in hopes to make you better and hopes to make your teaching better. So I want to start off with what is trauma? And I think about in my childhood growing up in the Midwest, I had a pretty awesome childhood growing up, played a lot of different sports, softball, swimming, tennis, basically had access to any sport that I wanted to play. And of course the nor normal childhood tribulations that we experience might create little bumps in the road. Maybe I got in a fight with someone at school and got in trouble, or I got grounded for a month because I came home late, like the normal childhood stuff. But then as I started to enter into my high school career and I reflect back, was there anything that was really traumatic that happened to me? And I go back to an experience of when I was a senior in high school and I was a multi-sport athlete playing basketball in the winter, track in the spring and golf in the fall. I pulled back to my senior year and I think about, gosh, the better I got, the bigger the stage was and the higher up that I get, the bigger the fall. Because if you're just mediocre, and you fall and you stumble, it doesn't hurt as bad. But when you start getting to the top levels and you fall, it hurts deeper and it cuts deeper. And so by the time I got to a senior in high school, I was bound to win my state championship. In my junior year, I finished runner up. And so by the time I became a senior, all the media outlets and all my support team were saying, you're due for a win. All the odds are stocked in your, stacked in your favor that you're gonna win this championship. And things were going that way until the second day, the very last hole of that event. And a mere triple bogey later, seven strokes, took me out of that first place, put me in runner-up again, and vanished all my dreams of being the state championship. And so, of course, grieving and having a wonderful support team around me allowed me to heal, and the passage of time is something that always heals our wounds. And I thought, okay, I'll set my sights to my college ranks and I'll move past um, that experience that really hurt and I'll go into my college career and I'll play my best. Well, just four years later, as I'm a senior in college, going into my last event of my collegiate career at NCAA championship, somehow the gods came together and said, I think you might win this one. So you're gonna have a great first round and you're gonna lead the event. And that happened. But it was such a similar experience to what happened when I was in high school. I was a leader going into such a big event. And the same thing happened. I couldn't seal the deal. And play deteriorated. And there was so much similarity in those four short years of being a leader and holding that event in my hands and then falling short. Call it choking. What's the consequences of choking? What's the aftermath of that choking experience? What sticks with us? So then I think about, okay, I've had some golf traumas in my life, but we're more than just golfers. We have our own personal experiences. And we know that when our students come to the lesson T, it's more about what happens in their world, kind of that macro point of view, and less about what the ball flight does sometimes. And we get to know these students on a personal level. What sort of traumatic events in their personal life might actually interfere with their golf performance? And for me, just two short years later, the biggest trauma that had occurred to me was that my house burned down. And everything that I could have potentially owned, every tangible thing, that I could have had in my world was taken away in a moment. And what I was left with was a bunch of ashes and burned items that were unusable. And so when I started thinking about all the things that I had collected in my life and what they meant to me, I felt like my identity got taken away. And this was one of the remnants that I pulled out of the ashes, this two ball putter. 
And then I thought to myself, well, it didn't make very many putts in college for me anyway, so probably good riddance to it. So that experience started to create some beliefs, albeit distorted beliefs, but some beliefs in my brain that said, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You've lost two really big events. You've lost everything that you've ever owned. You're not good enough. And so that led me to a path of abandoning golf. And I said, if golf is going to abandon me, then I'm going to abandon golf. And I'm going to reinvent myself, and I'm going to become a bartender. And so I started my career for a couple of months as a bartender. And actually, it was kind of a good gig for me, because if some of you that know me, I'm a big rule follower. I like to follow steps, call myself a mixologist. So I was doing pretty well. And what we know is from the ashes rises the phoenix. And we have an opportunity to reinvent ourselves. And after about a year of abandoning golf and being away from it and trying to find my place in this world, because I had the freshest slate ever. I didn't own anything. I had what was on my body, and that was it. I was forced to play golf from my director of instruction once I moved back to California. And he said, you're going to play golf. Get some clubs. Let's get you signed with Callaway and go out there and start playing. And he forced me to get back on the golf course. And that process really reignited the internal desire to begin playing again. And so in 2007, I started to pick it back up. And I said, I think I'm going to make this my career. I'm going to play, and I'm going to teach, and I'm going to help people be better. Because I had an opportunity when everything was taken away from me and my personal trauma to find who I was and to be a better version of myself. And so that experience was really profound to me. And it gave me an opportunity to work with a clinician who said, you can overcome some of these trials and tribulations in your life. And so through a psychological process that helped me heal some of the deep wounds that I had been holding with me for many years, I was able to move past my past and be able to have a much more successful future. And after going through this process of working with this clinician, I said, I have got to do this because I've got to help other people recover from their past. Because in this room, the one thing that levels the playing field, take away all accolades, all titles, where you work, what achievements you had, how much money you make, strip all of that away. And the one thing that puts us all on the same playing field is our personal traumas. So in this room, we are all linked through our experiences of embarrassment and shame and vulnerability. And that's the one thing that connects us in this room. So I want to ask you, if you reflect back on your golf performances or your personal life, have you ever had a distressing memory about a failure in performance? And if you have, I would ask that you please stand and remain standing for a moment if you've ever experienced a distressing memory about a golf performance. <laughs> this is going to be easy. Most of the room is already up. There's a couple of more, so hang with me, please. Have you ever had dreams about that failed performance or fear of it happening again? If you're not standing, please stand up. There's a couple of people who are like, yep, all the time. Have you ever had flashbacks from a poor shot to where it becomes interfering? Maybe you're standing over a short three-foot putt, and you're about to make it, and a flashback occurs. If this has happened to you, please stand and remain standing. Anyone in this room ever feel anxious or nervous because you think back to that failed performance and you hope that it doesn't happen again? If so, I think we've got almost everybody in this room standing. And if you're not, one of these is going to relate to you. What about intrusive thoughts or negative feelings about that failed performance? These words pop into your head, oh no, here we go again. Attempts to avoid having that thing happen again. So perhaps maybe you start smoking during your round or you drink during your round to try to create distance between that feeling of this poor shot happening again. 
Or maybe you just completely avoid going to that golf course where it occurred or using that golf club that created that poor shot. Now almost looks like I've gotten 100%. Look at this, we are all connected through our trauma. Now, most of you stood up on the first one, but at least one out of these seven apply to all of you. And if you've experienced five or more of these situations, it could be diagnosable for PTSD. <laughs> it's interesting, I've adapted this from the DSM-5 to fit golfers. Hopefully this hits home and shows you that we all experience trauma and we're connected through our trauma. Thank you for engaging, you feel free to have a seat. So as golf professionals, you basically are a version of a therapist. Your student's gonna come to you with a lot of common themes that's going to impact their performance. For example, some of you that may work with tour professionals experience communication issues, a breakdown of communication between caddy and player, or a breakdown of communication between teacher and coach. Are you equipped to handle these communication issues? Other themes in impacting performance, lack of goal setting. If we don't have a blueprint that's created to follow, we don't know where we're going, there's no roadmap to follow, that can create uncomfortableness in a player and, a, and an increase in chaos. The ability to regulate emotions, when things start to get tough, do you have the ability to regulate the experience that's going on in your body? It impacts performance. As self-confidence starts to decrease, do you have the ability to help your players improve their confidence? Concentration, we are in such a busy world. Com I'm competing for your attention because there's so much stimulus going on in this world. How do we help our students concentrate better? How do you concentrate better at your place of work? And can you relax in pressure situations? If you're gonna come up on stage and present and be vulnerable in front of your peers, are you able to relax and be able to perform when things start to get tough? If anyone has suffered from the yips or had a player who has experienced the yips, it's an anxiety-based disorder. Are you equipped to handle and speak on that with your student? Is there a lack of imagery and visualization as your players are trying to perform their best? Is it a skill that you're capable of teaching? And lastly, our focus for today, can you handle other people's trauma? Can you hold the gravity of it? Can you experience it with them? Or your own personal trauma, are you brave enough and vulnerable enough to share it to help heal and move past it? These are all things that golf professionals have to deal with and be equipped with the tools to help their students become better. Now I shared a little bit about my own personal trauma, but what does personal trauma look like? We actually see it every weekend when we watch the PGA and the LPGA tour. There's lots of examples and I've compiled
Now you've seen a couple of, of recaps on there. I showed Lexi a couple of times. Jordan, we know what happened at the Masters and what then happened the year after. We've seen DJ be in the lead and have some putting issues and not be able to close it out. And so you must resonate with those experiences because maybe that has occurred to you in your own section events or chapter events or playing in college level tournaments. Your students are certainly experiencing these sorts of events on the golf course because we're all related, we're all connected through our trauma. So what really is trauma? I gave you a golf trauma story, a personal trauma story. I showed you what golf trauma is. Well, the dictionary version is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, which is pretty vague. It could include a lot of different scenarios in our life. And for a long time, the American Psychological Association said in order to have a trauma experience, it really had to put your life in danger. There must be the fear, the horror, the helplessness that you weren't going to survive, that your life was gonna be taken away from you, or you were to witness an event that was so distressing. Well, that doesn't seem like it really applies to us on the golf course unless we're going to be attacked by a bear or we get struck by lightning on the golf course, God forbid. But the actual current terminology of trauma and what the definition is for the past 20 years is it's a deeply distressing event that interferes with a person's sense of control and that this experience really inhibits pers a person from taking that event and incorporating it into their reality. And it's this combination between one's personal vulnerability and their sense of reality. Well, that sort of opens the door for a lot more experiences to be considered traumatic because our trauma in this room might differ in terms of intensity and scope and context, but from our perspective, a missed three-foot putt to lose out on a million-dollar paycheck could be deeply distressing. Or it could be quite shameful to shank a shot and hit a spectator in a tour event. So from our point of view, we have a lot of freedom to say what is traumatic to us. Trauma is broken up into two categories, large T trauma and small T trauma. Large T trauma would be the big events like 9-11, participating in combat, having a disaster happen, the earthquake in Northridge, the fires as of lately, car accident, plane accident. Those are called large T traumas and those are typically the basis for a PTSD experience. But small t trauma is what's actually more in the ter term of athleticism is when we have huge failures, disappointing losses during our performance. But it could also be getting fired from a big job or going into bankruptcy, getting divorced from a loved one, legal battles, custody battles. Those can be considered adverse life events and small t traumas. And that's the basis for athletic traumas. And they are just as impactful as being in a plane crash or being in an assault because it can lead into anxiety-based disorders. It can certainly increase depression, decrease your self-esteem, increase your self-doubt. The more small t traumas that you have building up in your life, if you don't have the skills and the ability to cope with them, can turn into what we call psychopathology, or the issues or the conflicts that we try to deal with. And small t traumas are the things that occur on the golf course. Going into the final day of a section championship and not being able to seal the deal, or having a really big number. I think of the LPGA Senior Championship that happened earlier this week, and there was a player that accrued, I think, 58 penalty strokes. Now that might be pretty traumatic for that player. 58 penalty strokes, that's gotta go in the Guinness Book of World Records, that's unheard of. But again, it's all in the context of our perspective. The NCAA in 2014 conducted some research and said nearly every single athlete experiences a disappointment or a failure at least once in their athletic career. 
And those adverse events, if not dealt with properly, can lead into bigger issues. So something that happened to you maybe 10 years ago, you think that maybe you just slapped a Band-Aid on it, the wound isn't gushing anymore, well, it can actually become triggered and open the door for more psychopathology later on in your life. Maybe all of a sudden you go through insomnia or you have anxiety or panic attacks and you have no idea why, because life is pretty good. It's quite possible that it's linked back to earlier trauma. And golfers and athletes are not immune from trauma. We experience it every time we go onto the golf course. You might experience little bits of trauma every single day. You go to your place of work, someone didn't show up on time, the bathroom is flooding, your president of your board is really mad at you because you made a wrong move in a tournament, or you go into a playoff to win an event and you hit it out of bounds, or you four putt the last green to not shoot the score that you need to shoot in order to win. It can lead into an inability to hit shots because your body starts to respond to it being in trauma again, and your mind can start running a mile a minute as it's trying to process and figure out how to cope with what's going on. And so small t trauma, I think, is just as impactful as the really heavy stuff that interferes with our life. The brain is capable of processing traumatic events very healthily, and it does so all the time. In fact, we call that learning. So as a little kid, if you were to touch fire and burn your hand, you learned very quickly to never touch fire again. Maybe it was traumatic in the moment, but your brain made an association and we call that learning. And the brain has to do that in order for survival, otherwise we wouldn't exist. We'd have one car accident and we'd be vanished off this earth. We learn through our trauma experiences. But our brain also creates associations. So if I were to say roses are red, you might respond with, why? Because your brain made an association somewhere with a nursery rhyme back in the day. If I said apples, you might say, why not say banana? Why not say pineapple? There's an association made in our brain. And our brain is organized into, oh, there's fruit. She says apples, I think of oranges. We always say apples to oranges. And then I might start listing other fruit. I have these learning experiences, don't touch fire, wear my seatbelt when I go into a car. And that helps me learn and helps me survive in this world. But there are certain scenarios that occur that our brain is not capable of processing that traumatic event. And it becomes so overwhelming that we can't use that experience to learn. So that memory essentially becomes stuck. And see, what happens is our brain is very busy throughout the day figuring out what information we want to keep what information and we want to discard, and then if something is so overwhelming and our body can't deal with it, it doesn't know what to do with it, so it makes it stuck. And when that traumatic experience gets stuck in your brain, you continually become triggered, and you have these open wounds that can easily become pushed. So think about working with a student who maybe has trauma and you don't know what their trauma is because we look from the outside in, and in something that you say, or in some how that you treat that person, you trigger their trauma. And now their golf performance isn't what you expect it to be or what they expect it to be. How would we know? Well, if we start looking at players from the inside out, we might be able to work with their trauma, understand their trauma, and connect to them with their trauma. When a memory about a golf performance or any performance is stored, it's stored with three very important pieces. The picture of what happened, the feeling of what it was like in our body, and then the belief that we have about it. So if I have a very pleasant experience of a hole-in-one, and our chief membership officer, Nikki Gatch, just got her first hole-in-one recently, I think it was yesterday or a couple of days ago, that memory is fresh in her mind, and she probably has a picture of exactly what it looked like. In that whole story of getting a hole-in-one, there's probably one picture that stands out 
about what was so impactful about it. And then if she pulls up that picture, her body will experience the feeling, the joy of getting that hole in one. And there's a belief that's also attached to that memory about, wow, how awesome was that? I've played golf for X amount of years and I finally secured and earned that hole in one. And that completes a memory. So we go about our day, we have all these experiences, and then by the time we go to sleep, our brain is very, very busy trying to figure out which memories we need to put into long-term memory and which ones we need to discard. And the hippocampus is responsible for that process. And if it gets to a memory and it says, ooh, this is too big, there's too much emotional stuff tied in with this, I don't know what to do, I'm just gonna leave it there. And if you've ever watched a person sleep, they will go through a REM stage and behind their closed eyelids, you will see their eyes moving back and forth. And when their eyes are moving back and forth, that is the process of their brain consolidating all of the day's information and putting it in a file folder. And that part is really important because if something is so overwhelming and it doesn't get filed properly in our brain, we're gonna continually have this open wound that will bleed and become triggered. There's a very important part of the brain that is responsible for the emotional context of memories. Now, some of you may have seen this before in other presentations, but I'm gonna walk you through what the brain looks like and how it responds when things become so overwhelming. So if you entertain me for a minute and hold up your hand, we're gonna go through a model of the brain. Now, the wrist going into the hand, we're gonna call this the spinal cord, representative of the spinal cord. It's basically uh, the, tr the 405, if you will, of sending messages to the body. Maybe the 405 is a horrible excuse because you can never go anywhere on the 405, but it's meant to set, send messages throughout the body. And then we have the brain stem that goes into our head complex. If I take my thumb and I roll it in, we're gonna call this the limbic system. The limbic system is responsible for motivation, for memory, emotion, learning. The thumbnail of the limbic system is the amygdala. And that's the structure that holds the emotional content of memories. So if you think back to your wedding day or your 21st birthday or winning your first golf tournament, that part is responsible for the emotional piece that comes up with the memory. But it also helps us perceive the memory through anger, through aggression, through frustration. The limbic system talks to the outer part of our brain to send messages, and so when we roll our hand over, this outer part is called the cortex, that wrinkly part on brains, and that helps us perceive what's happening in the outside world. What's this golf tournament mean to me? What sort of equipment do I need to succeed in this golf tournament? And if I turn my hand to the side, the front of my knuckles is the prefrontal cortex, which is talked a lot about in golf performance, helping with executive decisions and forethought and strategy, course management. It really doesn't form until we're 23. And so as we have this structure, something big happens to us. We hit a horrible shot that really explodes our body. We have a traumatic event that occurs in our life and our body becomes so overwhelmed, we can't figure out what's going on that we literally flip our lid and we can't think straight and we put our foot in our mouths as we're having a conflict with a loved one and we do the wrong things and we say the wrong things and we make the wrong decisions because our limbic system is becoming so overwhelmed that our brain can't handle it. And when you use this hand model and you think about this for a moment, if I know what's going on and I can sense in my body the physical sensations that's coming up for me and I can understand that I'm about to flip my lid, I might be able to use some tools to think better to save some relationships so I don't say the wrong thing, to respond in a cool and calm fashion, to make better decisions on the golf course rather than have a big number. There's a process that I use in my psychology practice called EMDR, and this is basically the solution, if you will, to PTSD and traumatic memories and athletic tra uh, traumatic events. Now, in order to use EMDR, you have to have a license to practice psychology. 
so you won't be able to use this with your students, but it might open up your mind to think about referrals in the future if you have someone who you notice has stuck memories and their performance is not moving where you'd want them to go. Or maybe you might be inspired to want to learn more about EMDR and how it might help you individually as a human and help your golf performance. And EMDR stands for eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. And basically what it does is it mimics what happens in REM sleep. So as my eyes are moving back and forth as I'm sleeping and my brain is chunking out all the information and trying to put it in different categories, if I do that in a waking state, I have the ability to make really tough memories and sad memories become less painful. And it gives me the opportunity to not just put a Band-Aid on the wound, but to actually sew it up and heal it for good. And EMDR hypothesizes that all of our psychopathology, meaning all of our things that we experience, whether it's anxiety or depression, it all comes from stuck memories. It all comes from big things that have happened in our life and our inability to process those things. Because it looks at the memory in a three-pronged approach. What has happened to us in the past shows up today in the present and it impacts what happens in the future. And so with EMDR, we're able to heal the past so that you can get past your past and create the future that you want. EMDR is used a lot for individuals that are dealing with depression, anxiety, of course, PTSD, but it's also used on the flip side, not just to heal from trauma, but to set a template for how you would like to perform. If you have a big event coming up, like I'm heading to the PGA Women's Cup, uh, my flight leaves at four o'clock, as I'm prepping to compete in that, I will be using a different version of EMDR called tapping to desensitize my anxiety. Or before coming up on stage and talking in front of my peers, of course I'm gonna be nervous because I care, and I can use a version called tapping to help desensitize the emotions that my body is going through. So EMDR can be used to set a template for your future success of how you would like to perform. And it uses the properties of what's called bilateral stimulation. So we have two halves of our brain, and by using the right and left side of our body, we're able to desensitize what our experience is. And you experience this on an everyday level when you walk and think about something that's really troubling, which is actually how this was discovered. If you have something that was really chaotic at work and maybe you had an interaction with an employee that you weren't very happy with, and you go home at night and you're like, I just need to go walk it off, right, left, right, left, that's bilateral stimulation. Your body is processing through that really tough event. What EMDR looks like is, is forming a relationship with the client and sort of creating a hierarchy of what are some of the traumatic events that have happened in their life that may be impacting their performance. And once we determine what the most graphic picture is about that horrible experience, what the belief is and what the sensations are in one's body, then I move the patient's eyes back and forth with my fingers or with ferret theratappers or with audio sounds. And they basically go through what a REM cycle would look like in a waking state. And as their eyes are moving back and forth, it's igniting both half of their brain and they're able to desensitize the intensity of that memory, essentially moving it along, getting it out of this stuck place and putting it back into long-term memory. So a golfer is gonna recall the worst part of the event, perhaps it's a shank that ended up hitting someone in the crowd. And so they think about what was the worst part. The worst part was seeing that golf ball hit someone in the head and feeling bad about what that experience was. What's the emotions that you had in your body? I felt like I wasn't good enough. I felt so ashamed that I hurt another person. What did it feel like in your body? I felt like there was pins and needles in my hand. My heart started to race really fast. And so we find out what the picture is, what the belief are, what the sensation is, and the patient will hold it in their mind, and as the eyes are moved back and forth, it eventually starts to become desensitized, becomes less painful, and it's easier to move along and store in a healthier place. 
So I want to share a little bit about some current research that I conducted last year and recently got published about an LPGA and a Symmetra Tour player who went through this process. Now, the LPGA player who reached out to me wanted some help because she was feeling anxious in her everyday life. And she saw one of my presentations and she's like, I think I have some golf trauma I'd like for you to help me. And with over 30 years of experience and winning on multiple tours, European, European tour and LPGA tour, at this stage, I thought, she's got it going for her. But she still had some residual trauma from something that happened in her early teens. And then a second participant who I was working with had a very, very upsetting placement in the money leader list that, per, that prohibit her from earning her LPGA card. And so that experience really suffered years after in her performance. Now, as both of these people approached me and wanted to get some help, I had to figure out if they were the right type of client for this casework. And number one is a person can't dissociate when they think of their trauma. So oftentimes when something is really, really emotionally arousing, we don't want to think about it anymore, and so we kind of go somewhere else. We check out. So I had to give them an assessment, assessment to make sure that if we were going to pull up something that was emotionally arousing, they weren't going to check out. And then, of course, in research, we have to have some baselines, some standards. And so I chose to measure their anxiety levels and their self-confidence. And then afterwards, we would have some follow-up interviews to see how their performances were after the treatment. And so as I share a little bit about these two clients, the first participant, the 30-year tour veteran, she recalls this time where she qualified for a junior national team and she's sitting in her hotel room and she can hear her other teammates in the room next door talking trash about her. Now you would think, okay, maybe it's like teenage bullying, what's the big deal, move on, is that really traumatic? It was for her, because soon after they went out onto the putting green and had a putting contest, and all she could think about was how awful these girls had been talking about her, and she soon started to miss a lot of putts. And then as an adult, that led her to not want to be socially interactive, because she was scared of trusting other people, and her putting suffered. So that was her target in the EMDR treatment, is she really wanted to focus on that event, hearing those girls talk about her in the hotel room. Now, the Symmetra Tour player remembers the tour administrator's face coming into the room as soon as the last group finished, shaking her head, and she knew that she finished 11th. The top 10 get their card to go to the LPGA the next year. And so that was the most horrific image for her, is knowing that her dream to play on the LPGA Tour was vanished. And so she chose that as her target to process because she felt like she just couldn't quite get over the hump to start winning events again, to see if she could ever qualify for the tour. And so in these two different participants, we worked on those targets and we went through some EMDR sessions. Now this is usually the slide where everyone checks out because there's a bunch of numbers, rows and columns, but let me just tell you the story of them. So of course I have to measure anxiety on just a normal baseline, and then I need to measure anxiety before they go and play. And both participants had pretty high levels of anxiety on just an every given day, which means during their quiet moments. So as they're living their lives, they have pretty high anxiety. Then I measured their self-confidence, which surprisingly, looking from the outside in, I thought they were both very confident women. But their confidence scales were rated pretty low. So we have high anxiety, we have low confidence. Now, after treatment, and they all process differently, sometimes it might take one session for somebody to get through a trauma, sometimes it might take several sessions. Both of their anxiety levels went down and confidence skyrocketed, which is pretty amazing because the two different types of anxiety I measured was the anxiety that we have in our brain, like that's the ruminating thoughts and our mind going a mile a minute and the words and phrases that go through our head, and then the somatic anxiety, like that feeling that you have in your body with your heart racing or the being on pins and needles. Their anxiety went down, their confidence increased, all from healing this traumatic event. I also wanted to measure the impact of that event. So you might think girls talking about me in the hotel room next to me, like that's not a big deal, 
but for the LPGA Tour player, she rated it a 28 out of 36. And after treatment, she rated it a zero, which basically means, hey, this doesn't bother me anymore. It's not a big deal. The Symmetra Tour player rated the impact of the events 22, and it decreased all the way down to a seven, which basically means, hey, this really sucked. It's a part of my existence, but I'm able to move past it. We also rated how strongly they believed they were healed from that moment. And the LPGA Tour player wanted to feel like she belonged. And at the beginning of her treatment, she's like, I don't belong. Girls don't like me. I don't get along with women. People talk about me. At the end of the session, she felt, you know what? I do belong. I have a place here. The Symmetra Tour player, she wanted to have the belief that she was doing her best. And if her best was finishing 11th, then that was her best. And next year, she could reset her goals to see if she could try and, and earn a title or try to get one of those top 10 cards. And interestingly enough, after this work for the Symmetra Tour player, she won her first event of the season that following year, which was pretty profound. And of course, if you want to read any more details about the study, it was just published about two weeks ago, so there's some really cool stuff in there. Now, you know about trauma, you've seen trauma, we're all connected in this room by our trauma. You've heard some success stories through EMDR and trauma. How do you coach trauma? Not being a therapist, not being a psychologist, what do you do when you're on the green grass and you have someone in front of you? Number one, you have to expose them to that experience. So if they have the chipping yips and it occurs on a given hole, you bring them out to that hole and you work through it. And you tie in relaxation techniques, you tie in positive imagery, and you expose them time and time again so that their body becomes desensitized to that experience. It's what we do if somebody has flying anxiety. We progressively move them mentally into different situations where they have to get exposed to flying with the ultimate place being actually on a plane and flying and using their relaxation techniques to successfully go through something that's really anxiety provoking. It's important for you to help your students identify when they become triggered. So in my personal example, clearly I became triggered when I had a lead and had to close it out. And that may be always something that I continue to struggle with, but it doesn't define my existence as a golfer anymore. Can you help your students define what their triggers are? Is it a short 20 yard chip? Is it a chip over water? Is it a drive on a dog leg left? What triggers them to fail their performance? And having a plan B, what's their backup plan when their swing just completely deteriorates and they're in the thresholds of competition? Do they have a swing that they can manufacture to at least advance the golf ball down the fairway? Do they have a punch shot? Do they have a backup club like they don't hit driver off the tee anymore and they go to three wood or hybrid? Create a plan B because that can help boost confidence when you know that it's hitting the fan and the golf ball is not going the way you want it to, you have that backup plan. Those are great ways that you can start to train your students to move past their trauma also to refer to an EMDR therapist, a sports psychology consultant. And lastly, something that we can all do in this room is a form of bilateral stimulation called tapping. And tapping is taking the ability to desensitize the anxiety in the moment by just using your hands and touching the sides of your body, squeezing your feet, squeezing your hands, stimulating the right and left side of your body. So if you get into an anxiety provoking situation, you can use tapping to at least calm your nerves effectively. You certainly can't use tapping to help heal from trauma. That's where you'll need a higher level of care with a clinician. But it's something that we can all do in this room to help desensitize in the moment. But on the positive side, you can use tapping to prepare yourself for the future. So if you have an event coming up and there's a shot that you'd like to perform better, you can use tapping to set the stage and access the positive resources that you need in the moment and set the stage and cue them up to prepare yourself. 
And what's neat about tapping is you can do it in a group situation like this. So there's some therapists that will go to some of the big trauma sites after hurricanes, um, after big fires, after 9-11, and they'll be able to get a whole bunch of victims in the room tapping immediately after the event has happened to desensitize the gravity of that event. And there's some really interesting research about when someone goes through a traumatic experience, whatever that looks like for them, if immediately after the event, they start watching a movie or playing a video game or reading a book and they shift their mind to something else, it can actually desensitize the anxiety and the trauma in the moment. Because the theory behind that is if I have this traumatic emotion going on in my brain, and I make it harder for it to stick by taxing my working memory, by doing something different, I can effectively decrease the power of that really severe event. So if you'd like to participate, I'll walk you through the ability to tap to prepare yourself for the future. So as you tap, there's a couple of different ways that you can participate. If you have your arms across your body, we call this a butterfly hug, and you can slowly tap the right and left shoulder back and forth. Or if you want to put, if you're sitting in a chair and you want to put your hands on your knees, you can tap back and forth. Or merely you can just squeeze your toes in your shoes. And when you tap back and forth, when you set a stage for your success, you want to go very slowly. Because in EMDR, when we try to desensitize the memory, we go really fast. So I want you to think of an area of your golf game that you'd like to be better in. Maybe it's four foot putts or hitting a drive off the first tee. So I want you to think about in your personal golf game, what's one thing that you'd like to be a little bit better in? And then ask yourself, so what qualities, or we'll call them resources, would you need to be better in that segment of your game? Do you need to have more confidence? Do you need to improve a mechanical aspect? Um, do you need to have more focus? So recall, what do you actually need in order to make that happen? And then go back in your memory bank and pull up a time when you've seen yourself use that resource and been successful. So is there a four foot putt that you remember that you closed to win a tournament? Or a really tough up and down? or a very, very tight fairway that was maybe 25 yards wide and you just nutted a drive right down the middle. Pull up the memory of the time that you have performed that and look at the qualities. And I want you to be as vivid as possible. I want you to look at the picture. I want you to smell the smells. I want you to see the sights. What did it feel like in your body? I want you to think about the resources that you need. I want you to see the picture. I want you to feel it in your body and then you're gonna start tapping back and forth, either on your knees or on your shoulders. Hold the picture in your mind, notice the sensation in your body, what's the belief you had about yourself, what resources do you need, and then you tap back and forth. Now, while you do that, you might notice a sense of relief that goes over your body, sort of soothing. A lot of times when you see small kids rocking back and forth, it's a soothing motion, helps calm them. So as you're trying to set the framework for how you would like to perform, and you go to areas of your game that you're struggling with, and you pull up the pieces that you know that you're gonna need, you can literally tap them in to your body tap it into your brain so that when you go to that site, when you go to that par five that's really, really tight, or you have a four footer that you need to make for a tough up and down, your body goes back to that blueprint, not to the one that holds the trauma memory of when you missed it. Now, the more you do it, the more activated it becomes. So just doing it one time gets you exposed to it, but it needs to become a routine, it needs to become a habit. And so tapping is a great way for you to desensitize yourself in a moment. If you're starting to feel like you're becoming too aroused and too elevated, you can tap to kind of calm yourself. And then in preparation, you can use it to plan for your future. 
There's a great book called Tapping In by Laura Parnell, and she goes through several different scripts of different scenarios if you have a big presentation in front of your board to ask for a bunch of money to build a teaching academy, or you have a sport performance, or you're gonna fly on an airplane and you have anxiety. She goes through these different scripts of ways that you can use tapping from a mass level to help improve yourself. So I wanna thank you so much for this opportunity to share my information with you today. You have a wonderful lineup of speakers over the next day and a half, which I'm sure is gonna be on the other end of the spectrum from what I talked about today. But I think when you start looking at players and understanding from the inside out and a macro level, as Jamie said, you will understand them on a deeper level and it might have you start to think differently about what are some of their limitations in performances. Is it really just being stuck on mechanics or is there something in their inner world that is pre preventing them from reaching their potential? So again, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate this opportunity.